Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Today I have with me Dr. Tommy Wood. Um, I'm not sure, Tommy, have you been on the podcast or did I just have your partner from Nourish, Bound, Thrive? Yeah, you, you may have had Chris uh, yeah. uh, back in the day. Uh, but no, I don't think I have been. I think I interviewed you for our podcast when we had one, okay. uh, but I don't think I've been on your show. All right. Well, um, would you introduce all the credentials you have? Because there's a sure. long list on your email and um, <laughs> I forget, to, but it, please explain what you do. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, I am an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, most of my work is running a lab, the Neonatal Neuroscience Lab, where we study ways to treat the injured newborn brain. Uh, but we also do work in traumatic brain injury and increasing, uh, increasingly doing some work in cognitive decline in, in later life. So kind of looking at the brain across the entire lifespan. Uh, um, yeah, the just, two just most just important times to get, to get those nutrients that I'm yeah. so passionate about in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and one of the things that I'm most interested in is in how what we can learn about in the developing brain then tells us about the aging brain as well. I think there's more similarities than most people you know usually think about. Um, but alongside that, so I, I have uh, undergraduate training in biochemistry. I went to medical school at the University of Oxford. I worked as a doctor for a couple of years in London. Then I did a PhD in physiology and neuroscience. Um, and so alongside my academic career, uh, which is a lot of it's based in the lab, um, I've also worked with multiple companies uh, looking at health and performance uh, athletes, uh, adults with chronic health conditions. Uh, I currently work with uh, Formula One drivers. That's the main sort of group that, that I currently work with, but also some other companies looking at um, sort of democratizing various aspects of health and digital health to try and improve outcomes in as many people uh, as possible. That's sort of, you know, just a few of my sideline activities. <laughs> Amazing, amazing stuff. And, um, and so we've been friends for a while. I think we probably met through the ancestral health, like at one of those yeah. conferences or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and so you reached, will you explain why you reached out re most recently to me? Yeah. So I, uh, I subscribe to your newsletter and I, and, uh, I read it every week and I'm a big fan of, of sacred cow and I'm, I've known Rob for a long time. I'm a big fan of his as well. Um, and uh, you you linked to a, a story in the Daily Mail, uh, this uh, newspaper in the UK, about how Edinburgh uh, in Scotland was signing up for this thing called the Plant-Based Treaty. And what they intimated was that as part of this sort of attempt to, uh, you know, improve people's health and the planet's health at the same time, they were going to remove animal products or meat uh, from the menus at schools, hospitals, and nursing homes. And um, what particularly got me worked up is this idea that we're essentially decreasing the nutrient density and quality of the foods for those who are most at risk. Um, and that is the aging population, but also, you know, if you're feeding kids in schools, the kids who get free school meals are those with a lower socioeconomic status who may not, uh, who may have food insecurity at home, may have other uh, problems uh, getting access to high quality foods, and those are the kids that we're removing these nutritious foods from. And that, I mean, it got me re really worked up. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. So, um, I emailed uh, the board of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I am one of the founding trustees. I still sit on the board, and. What's different about the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine compared to other lifestyle medicine societies? We're now the second largest in the world. But one thing that was very important to us was to make sure that all the different ways that we can use lifestyle to improve health were incorporated. And that includes multiple 
uh, theories of uh, diets and how they can how they can improve health. So, in particular, not being uh, you sort of dogmatically focused on plant based foods as and plant based diets as being the focus yeah. And I health. should qualify that. So, for people who don't know, the um, most of the lifestyle medicine type organizations. Um, I think it's the American Academy of Lifestyle Medicine. What, what is the um, American, American College version of, of it? Medicine, yeah. American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and I believe there's one in Australia as well. But they are, um, uh, they have their kind of roots in the Seventh Day Adventist hmm. uh, religion, and they are extremely plant based, even though they don't kind of come out and say it. But when you go to any of their nutrition, um, like when you really dig into their nutrition, it is all uh you know everything is caused by animal source foods and and all solutions lifestyle wise uh re- require the removal of animal source foods and yeah. they're working pretty closely with the Biden administration right now so i am very concerned about this group and when you told me that you um have ties to the british one i'm sure you knew that i was going to feel triggered yeah, by that uh, and so you qualified it right away and told me no 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 it's not the same it's not the same yeah and uh, so particularly i mean the the lifestyle medicine movement as people think of it was started by the americans and that's where this plant based ideology is really rooted the mm-hmm. the australians i will say are much more aligned with the Brits in terms oh, of good. being okay. uh, all encompassing, and you know you're really taking a the, a true view of all the all, all the available uh, evidence and acknowledging that multiple different dietary strategies are going to be uh, important for different people. Right. Um, but yeah, so I did have to qualify that because that's something you know lifestyle medicine sort of comes baked in with 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 plant based diets, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then, so I I, I emailed the board. And, you know, I outlined the concerns I basically said to you, like, if this happens, then we're decreasing, you know, we're decreasing the quality of the diets for those who are most at risk. And unanimously, everybody agreed with me and everybody got really worked up. And so I think that kind of signifies that, you know, the, the sort of the, the ideologies we use in our society sort of align with what I just said. Mm-hmm. And uh, a letter was very quickly written to the Edinburgh City Council, um, and actually many of the members are based in Scotland. So this is you know, very close to home for them. You know, outlining, you know, we really need to see the evidence for these practices. This is why we think there's risks associated with this, all this kind of stuff. And they wrote back very quickly and said, this isn't true, we're not doing this. Um, the Daily Mail has 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 said something that, that's not correct. Um, so a, a part of me felt a bit bad that I sort of, worked everybody up into a frenzy because of this but um equally i was really heartened by the response Mm -hmm. um and i was also i think this is important because this is not gonna be the first uh, the last time that we hear about something like this so Mm -hmm. so i think being prepared uh, you know and making sure that we have the available evidence to kind of show why um these foods are important for for you know particularly people at either end of life and those who are most disadvantaged um you know, I, th- I think we'll we'll have those arguments ready as more of this comes in the future, which I'm sure it will. Yes. Well, um, I would actually love to see that letter sort of stripped of who it's to and f- you know, from, you know, uh, just so that I could maybe, you know, share some of the points in it. And um, I'm also seeing some pretty scary stuff coming out of England, actually Oxford County mm-hmm. um, or Oxford I don't know what they call it, county or. It might be the uh, yeah, it's Oxfordshire. Shire. What Oxfordshire do you guys call? Is the, the <laughs> Oxfordshire is the county, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, a lot of these city governments in England are um, at least going plant based, uh, vegan for like the city meetings and things like that. So, so it is happening there, yeah. um, and it's you know just... if 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 a uh, consenting like adults co- cogn- cognitively functioning adults want to yeah. do that all power to them like no problem but as soon as you start pushing i mean of course we could debate the evidence but pushing this on others who cannot make that choice and for whom it it will really impact their health that's what that's why i I really think we need to to push back yes and i i completely agree with you people have asked me like do you have vegan friends and i do have vegan friends actually yeah Um, me too and uh i think personal choice is really important and it's a it's a it's a, a right But um, children and uh, seniors, especially those are relying on these meal services or people in a hospital, like 
recovering from a wound and yeah. or, or a, a burn, have having three times the protein requirement yeah. of, of any other person in that hospital. Um, taking meat away from these people is doing more harm than good. Um, and somebody needs to be shouting about it. So thank you. This, yeah, oh, thanks. So I've done a, a little bit of something similar um, here. Um, and again, often there's like saber rattling that they'll make these changes and it doesn't really, really happen. Um, but, you know, that that will change in the future. But here at Seattle Children's Hospital is, a, is an institution I'm affiliated with and uh, at times they've talked about uh, removing um, meat from from meals in various places and I've kicked a, kicked up a bit of a stink and uh, I think there's plenty of evidence for for why that's important particularly for the for the kids right if the adults want to go to the cafeteria and buy plant-based burgers rather than beef burgers I mean that's their choice uh, but you know for the kids I, I think it's really important that we make sure they get nutritious meals yeah um, I did go to a presentation by healthcare without harm. Um, and they were touting how, how great, you know, how they were saving the planet by reducing meat and, you know, uh, they were improving the nutrition. And I mean, my hand just shot up in the air <laughs> and, and <laughs> I was asking how, why, you know, um, and, 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 you know, oh, and by the way, they were saving the hospital all this money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Of you of know, course. and, and that's really a lot of times what it's about is cutting costs in food service because yeah. I mean, as a dietitian, I had to take a lot of uh, classes. Everyone who runs a food service um, operation in a hospital or um, any other like major institution, those are dietitians. Mm -hmm. And our training as dietitians is to send out an RFP and you have to go with the lowest bid. Like yeah. there's nothing about like sustainable food sourcing or, uh, quality food or anything like that, it's, you have to go with the lowest bid. And so, um, you know, if these plant-based companies can come through with cheaper alternatives to meat, then that's going to really sway these food service people. Yeah, and, and you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so curious. I didn't know about the Formula One racers. And I'm so curious before we jump into my big passion, which is making sure kids get the right nutrition. Um, I imagine that your typical formula one driver might have a sp very specific kind of profile as far as, um, you know, maybe someone who can hyper-focus, uh, and you know, high adrenaline. I don't know. Are there specific nutrients that, um, mm. Or, or specific things that you do as as a advising doctor to this population. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's a great question, and and actually, you know, I mean, sort of demographically, it's pretty well known that Formula One drivers are majority young white males. Um, there are some others, obviously Lewis Hamilton um, is the only black um, Formula One driver, and there are some some people of other ancestries, but it is kind of rooted in that demographic um, but with which they are working to, to change. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, they're actually all incredibly different. Um, okay. And one thing that I've learned uh, from working with Formula One drivers is that each one needs something very different and they thrive on a wide variety of diets. And I've seen them try a multitude of, of different things. And, you know, as they, come into the public focus um and you know either succeed or fail and then, and then go back um so it, it really does depend and uh, the majority of the work that i do is is very much ta tailored to the individual but mm. we you might think about some of uh some of the basics like a, a lot of the a lot of the drivers sort of almost on their own uh but with a bit of um uh, you know, sort of tinkering and empirical trial, they, they sort of shy away usually from, you know, a bunch of very high um, glycemic index carbohydrates, particularly around times when they perform. Often some drivers don't eat at all or very little on a race weekend um, because they feel that it helps their their cognitive function. But again, that's some eat a whole bunch. So it is, it's difficult to, to draw sort of exact um, rules. Uh, but then, you know, we'll do some, some testing and 
you will often look at nutrient status, some um, you know, minerals, omega-3 status, vitamin D we look at, homocysteine we look at, B vitamin status. You know, all of this is important for cognitive function. And I don't have, you know, a whole bunch of randomized controlled trials that say in a very healthy young population, you know, this is critical for for performance. But equally, you know, at the very spiky end when you when you don't really have much room um, to, to play around with things. You, you know, making sure you have all your bases covered, I think, is, is, is an important approach. So, so those are things that we'll look at and make sure that they're, you know, covering them to the best of, best of their abilities. All right. Um, okay. So let's move then to um, your specialty, which is pediatrics and brain function and, um, and the nutrients required for optimal brain function. Um, and where those come from mm-hmm. best. <laughs> is that a leading uh, question? Or what? Lead, I was exactly going to say, is that a leading question? Um, so the, you know, the, the, there's a lot of ways that, that we could cover this, but in, in reality, if, if you think about what nutrients have really been studied in terms of their importance for brain development, um, they are iron, uh, omega-3 fatty acids and B vitamins, like B12 being a critical one, but obviously uh, folate is very important, ensuring essentially um, that your methylation system is 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 running properly. And that's because largely that's required in order to make sure that the omega-3 fatty acids that you have are being inserted into the membranes and the neurons as uh, phospholipids where you need them. Um, and then choline would, would obviously be a, a very important one uh, as well. So... Where do we get those? Um, you get it from fish, eggs, m- and meat. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, unf- that's the that's the short answer. Um, and you know, very happy to to dig into. Well, I'm uh, glad you mentioned choline because mm-hmm. choline is one that gets dropped off a lot. It's not um, usually listed as one of those essential things that you see on like a nutrient panel, but um, it, it's another one that it, you know eggs are a pretty great source of choline. And if you're not consuming eggs um, and only eating a plant-based diet, I'm not sure there is any choline in any plant-based foods. Uh, so soy and sunflower lecithin are your okay. mains, main plant-based sources. And so if people are, if people are plant-based I, and you know, they can check their homocysteine and other things, but I would recommend that they, they take some. So you can, you can get it from a plant-based diet. You just have to be um, you have to f- focus on on a source, mm. um, but there's you know as as we see this sort of rising, um, it, both in mothers and the population in, in general, you know, increasing incidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease associated with metabolic syndrome. One of the potential underlying causes of that is a choline, essentially a population level choline deficiency, because choline is really critical for exporting fats out of the liver. Um, and there's been a big focus on choline supplementation in uh, sort of the the prenatal arena, you know, both because it's important for the fetus, but then it's also important for um, the mother's metabolic health. Um, so people, and there are some, now some randomized controlled trials uh, showing benefit of choline supplementation. So I think some of it is coming into that sort of, um, you know, neonatal or, or prenatal uh, area. But yeah, I think probably a, a large number of people could do with eating more choline. Yeah, uh, maybe we could go through each one of those uh, you know, major nutrient categories that you mentioned, and and just kind of you know, rattle off the the benefits, and then what happens in a deficiency or even insufficiency of that, because we, you know we don't really document a lot those insufficiencies, which you know for most people that aren't eating an exclusively whole foods diet, they're they're at risk of a maybe not a de- deficiency, but an insufficiency of that mm-hmm. nutrient. So we can. So I think I mentioned iron first. We can start mm-hmm. with with iron, and um, a lot of the work that uh, I do in the lab is around uh, preterm brain injury. So babies born earlier uh, than you know usual. So pre uh, being preterm is technically before thirty six weeks uh, gestation, and we know that the the more preterm you are, the higher the risk of some kind of neurodevelopmental impairment, and some of that is actually linked to the loss of iron uh, supply and, and iron regulation is critically important. Um, and 
I'm a part, so one of my uh, colleagues, Sunny Jewell, is, is, has run multiple uh, clinical trials looking at iron status in, in preterm babies. And we're, we're running a whole other one now, seeing if we can, uh, or she's running it, to try and improve iron delivery to preterm babies. And that's because um, iron is particularly critical for the development of white matter, which is, so if people think about a uh, human brain, it's kind of this big wrinkly structure. And on the outside, you have the cortex, which is the gray matter. And then, you know, that's actually qu quite a thin layer overall. And beneath that is this whole bunch of this sort of thick, dense, fatty stuff, which is the white matter. It's essentially these insulated neurons that are really critical uh, for sort of rapid communication in the brain. And, you know, compared to most other species on, on the planet, you know, particularly compared to rodents and things like that, humans have a bunch more white matter. This is a big part of the, the why we have the brains that we have. And iron is critically uh, important for, for that, for developing that part of the brain. And that part of the brain is also actively developing in that third trimester, that period during which um, preterm babies are born. So if they lose that iron source, you actually need to give them a whole bunch of iron while they're in the NICU, um, the neonatal intensive care unit, um, as they then grow you know in the hospital rather than in the uterus and for a long period of time people were really concerned that giving a bunch of iron would cause a whole bunch of oxidative stress um, but we have a, a number of data sets and some some actually statistical analyses of these big clinical trial data sets that i'm doing myself really showing that the more iron you give and the earlier you give it the better um, the neurodevelopmental outcome for that infant however the white matter doesn't stop developing uh, at term, right? It essentially finishes developing in your mid, uh, in your mid twenties. That's when your when your white matter essentially is finished developing as the prefrontal cortex is sort of fully matured. Um, but you know, it's more important earlier on. So really, in those you know periods of time, the first couple of years after birth, iron is critically important. And there's not a bunch of iron in breast milk, but there's um, there's there's enough. And then also some. Um, some things like lactoferrin to help you absorb um, the iron that you get in there. Um, but then as your brain can, continues to grow, uh, which it does uh, for several years after that, iron remains uh, really important. And the best source of bioavailable iron is, is from, from meat sources. Um, and I think uh, you yourself have posted um, or referred to multiple studies where if you actually look at randomized controlled trials of meat intake in in you know, those who have overall lower quality diets, usually in um, lower income settings, you know, there's a significant improvement in cognitive development. And I'm sure a big part of that is greater availability of iron because iron deficiency worldwide is one of the, if not the most common cause of any kind of neurodevelopmental impairment. Right. And, um, and you know, a couple things around that. Um, I actually did a um, nutrient intake challenge mm -hmm. um, where I was trying to get, you know, my D my DRI of all my nutrients, you know, under 2000 calories, but like max out every single one of my nutrients every day, which you don't need to do every single day. Yeah. But I was, that was my goal. I was like, I'm a dietitian. I should be able to figure this out without getting supplements. And the iron thing was really hard for me, even on the days where I ate red meat three times a day, mm -hmm. just like steaks. Yeah. I was not getting my iron requirement. And, um, and it was only when I would, I pulled in, uh, so I don't like the taste of liver. I did not grow <laughs> up eating liver, but I, um, I pulled in desiccated liver mm -hmm. supplements um, and had to, and you have to take like six of these in order to like actually, you know, make it qualify. And that was the only way I was able to get my iron. My whole goal was to beat Rhonda Patrick, uh, <laughs> cause she was in that, in oh, that this is too. In, is this in uh, Marty Kendall's like yes. diet, diet quality <laughs> challenge? Yeah. So every day I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm low on selenium. What, what has selenium? I'm running out <laughs> trying to find endives or whatever it was that I, you know, um, but, um, so iron you know, and you, you'll, kids don't like spinach. Um, they, oh, you know, they, there's a funny, there's a funny story about that. As what? Well. I don't know if you, so, um, Elsie Widowson, um, like a hundred years ago, essentially she was, uh, she published that first like nutritional chemistry of, of foods that, mm -hmm. that looked to like the iron content of foods and they got the decimal point in the wrong place for iron and spinach. 
Oh, and so that's, interesting. And so that's where that's where some of this, like, I mean, there is iron in spinach, of course, but that's the, where some of this. The, the myth, misperception uh, yeah, that, the, the, uh, that the, spinach is high in iron. Yeah. And, and probably Popeye, um, yeah. the cartoon oh, yeah, Popeye he, didn't he help. He definitely helped. Yeah. Um, but there was also another study that looked at um, an eight-year-old boys in India, and they couldn't even physically eat enough lentils, <laughs> like get them in their bodies to get the nutrients they required, especially, um, you know, the, the most concerning micronutrients. And so yeah. um, it can just be really hard. You know, we kids who are being told that meat is bad will almost certainly not get the iron requirement that they need. Yeah. And so I've had some, I, I know somebody else who's, who's working with some schools in the Middle East to try and improve because they have a, you know, increasing already high, but increasing rates of childhood obesity and, and types of diabetes. And so they're trying to improve the, the quality of nutrition in schools. And, you know, kids should eat more vegetables, right? That's oh, great. If they yeah. can, of course, they, they should. But you can't do that at the expense of saying that meat is bad, right? And that and that's where, you know, so I don't, in theory, have anything against like the occasional meal being meat free, fine. But if it comes with this messaging that makes them think that meat is bad for them, right? There's years of damage that that could come uh, along with that. Uh, exactly. Uh, that that's my whole point with the New York City public school system having vegan Fridays and meatless Mondays. It's not like, oh, what's my problem with salad? I'm such a yeah. fanatic, you know. Uh, <laughs> I eat salad. Sometimes I'll I'll, I'll eat a, a meal that doesn't have meat in it. But it's the um, all of the messaging from Meatless Mondays, which had great intention, but is yeah. not evidence based messaging, um, gets to go up in those schools, and these kids are hearing from their mayor that being a vegan is ideal because of obesity. And I think there's this disconnect that people think obesity is from overeating. So if we just take out the meat, they'll lose weight, and then they won't be obese anymore, and then everything will be fine. Like that's that's I think the logic that they're going on, and people are not understanding that you can be both obese and malnourished at the same time. Yeah, and there's, I mean, you can easily overeat, quote unquote, vegan foods, um, which I think is why some people, you know, some people will now focus on whole food plant based, right? If they're promoting a plant based diet, because at least some of it's baked into food quality right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't overeat a salad unless you've covered it in a bunch of salad dressing that's rich in, in oils and things like that. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's multiple areas of that thought process that are clearly yeah. flawed. This podcast was made possible by my favorite electrolyte company started by my friend and Sacred Cow co-author Rob Wolf, Element, the all-natural sugar-free powder you just add to water, which tastes great and gives you the perfect amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium to keep you perfectly hydrated. They have a limited time new grapefruit flavor, and I've developed a recipe on my blog for the salty grapefruit limeade, and I know you'll love it. So check it out and also take advantage of Element's free flavor sample pack with your purchase. So just visit Sustainable Dish dot com backslash lmnt to place your order remember just drinking plain water could actually leave you more dehydrated which is why you need to replenish your electrolytes element is absolutely the best tasting and cleanest option out there and i drink it daily so go to sustainabledish.com backslash lmnt to claim your free gift and thanks Um, okay, that was a lot on iron. Okay, uh, DHA and and EPA. Yeah. Um, so these are obviously your your long chain uh, omega three fatty acids. Um, we do have the capacity to synthesize them ourselves from precursors like uh, ALA, which you can get from plant based sources. But this is very genetically uh, driven, and even then it seems unlikely from the sort of like the, the bunch of available evidence. It, it's, it's basically unlikely that particularly during gestation um, that you can make enough uh, uh, omega-3 or, or DH, long-chain omega-3 or DHA for, for the developing fetus. Um, 
the what's interesting is that it's incredibly tightly regulated like that developing brain needs dha more than anything else dha uh, is like the first fat that really starts to accumulate in the brain alongside some arachidonic acid and then also oleic acid those are the three that kind of early on in brain development both in utero and, and early after birth um those are really the ones that the brain sort of sucks up and the, the mother will sacrifice her own dha stores so they're transported to uh, to the fetus so what's kind of good about our fat stores one of the good things about it is that they're essentially a depot for certain fatty acids and dha is one of them um so if you have sort of intermittently eating a good amount of fish throughout your life you've probably stored out stored up a fair amount of dha in your adipose tissue and then if you are um a, uh, if you're pregnant you will start to specifically draw that dha out of your adipose tissue in order to give it to your fetus because it's critical for the developing brain and it's very tightly regulated so you can look at the dha status of the mother and if they have a very high dha status they'll they'll move less of their dha over and if they have a low dha status they'll basically use up Jump everything they've got to give it yeah. to the baby because uh, it's so critical for the brain um the, the epa is probably less important for the brain itself but obviously we know that it's very important for things like cardiovascular function and, and, and stuff like that but dha is specifically uh taken up uh, into the brain there's there's also a number of studies that show sort of in developing children if they eat a diet that contains some seafood, it's associated with uh, improved neurodevelopmental outcomes. There's studies done in the Seychelles, there's studies done in the UK uh, that show that. Often people say, but what about things like heavy metals, mercury? You know, I'm worried about that for the brain. And, you know, I think there's a good amount of evidence that the selenium that, that comes along with that, with, with the seafood is protective against uh, the mercury that might be in seafood. And even then, you know, increased seafood, even though it comes with a higher, uh, slightly higher mercury burden, is still associated with improved uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes because of the DHA being so critical for the brain. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at, and we've even tinkered uh, with uh, in the lab, is sort of a, a competing effect of, of other fats in the diet. There's a lot of you know talk out there about the effects of, of seed oils, um, and I think some of them particularly in adults, are probably overblown. But in the developing brain, I am still very concerned about them. Um, you can kind of see over the last 60 years that the amount of linoleic acid in breast milk has gone up three or four fold at least because it's increased in our diets. And there are autopsy studies um, from babies who, who died of something unrelated to their brain where you look at the fatty acid composition of the brain and you can see that if they were fed a diet, like a formula that didn't have any DHA in it, but had a whole bunch of linoleic acid in it, that brain has no DHA and it's just full of linoleic acid. You like completely, yeah, you, you completely disrupt the accumulation of normal fats that are critical for, for, for brain function. Mm. So, and there are a bunch of animal studies that show something similar. If you have a very high amount of linoleic acid in the, in the sort of the mother's diet, this is rat studies then that brain is more susceptible to injury and it inhibits the uptake of DHA into the developing brain. So I say this not because I want everybody to be like really scared about this, but I think it's just really sort of hammers home the importance of making sure there's adequate DHA uh, in the diet so that it's, so that it's getting uh, into the brain um, because it does seem to both the, the fat itself and then some of its um, downstream metabolites seem to compete or prevent DHA getting into the brain as it, no as it normally would. And so in that particular part of life for that particular reason, you know, I think it is really important to make sure that you get a sort of a good balance of, of, of fats in the diet. Yeah. When my kids were little, they were fortunately really curious about food and like the more tentacles or eyeballs, <laughs> the more interesting to them. Uh, and especially my son. And so Things like chicken hearts on a skewer or mm -hmm. um, sardines, like the fact that he could see the whole fish and then eat it yeah. or an octopus or something like that to, to, to him, you know, and then I would talk about the benefits also, you know, not in, you know, white matter <laughs> language, but in <laughs> yeah. like super night vision or, or whatever I would say for, you know, vitamin A or whatever uh, really worked. So um, the um and, and one thing one nutrient that I haven't mentioned yet, but sardines reminds me of it. Sardine sardines are the highest food source of creatine, which is like 
creatine is magic for the brain. It does everything. Um, and 100 grams of sardines will, will give you like three to five grams of creatine, like the same as a creatine supplement that you'd recommend to most people. So there's a bunch of creatine in sardines. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it's also a wonderful source of calcium if you get it with the bones on yeah. it. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, that's another area where people could, could do better hmm. uh, as well. Um, all right. B12. <laughs> yeah. Keep so, going. <laughs> keep going. So uh, a B12, um, the, uh, you know, another critically important nutrient, again, probably for the brain, lot, well, maybe two two reasons. Uh, the second one is still slightly hypothet- hypothetical, but um, the first is that uh, sort of ha- running your methylation cycle properly, um, which B twelve is is sort of a critical component of, along with folate and a few other things. Um, it's you you need that system to function in order to create phospholipids um, in the in the membranes of the neurons in the brain. So we talked about. DHA being critical, but in order for DHA to do its job, it needs to be sitting inside the membrane of a cell. Particularly, it's concentrated in mitochondria and at the synapses, which are like the the, the areas where the neurons talk to each other. Um, and for it to sit in that membrane, it needs to be part of a phospholipid. Um, and there are three main things uh, to to a phospholipid. Um, it's uh, some fats, so DHA being one of them, glycerol and um uh, some kind of phos- uh, phosphorylated head group um and then choline is, is is a critical one of those that's why choline is really important because it forms that sort of head group um but in order to smush all those things together you need your methylation cycle to be working properly that's a, one of one of the important uh, things that that meth- methylation is used for um so that's where b12 is particularly uh, critical for the brain and when you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump to the other end of life because this is where I think there's some really nice evidence for this. Um, when I was working uh, on the elderly care wards at St. Thomas's Hospital in, in London, uh, a decade ago now, it's a long time ago. Um, but w- whenever somebody came to us first with, with cognitive decline, any kind of you know, suspected dementia or, or memory problems, the first thing we did was it was called a dementia screen. And we tested for iron status, vitamin D status, and uh, B vitamin status, B12 folate. And if uh, B12, B12 was either looked low-ish or was low, we also tested for something called methylmalonic acid, which is a, essentially a functional marker of B12 deficiency. Um, and that's because we know that these components are so critical for, for cognitive function. We were doing this in a, in a nationalized healthcare system you know, a decade ago. Wow. Um, and... The same is is true right at the beginning of life, um, but there are a, a bunch of studies in that area that kind of show this. So um, the B proof study done in the Netherlands, the Vitacog study done uh, at um, the University of Oxford. What they've essentially shown is that if you provide um, B vitamins, so they used like the cheapest, nastiest B vitamin supplements that you can get your hands on. Um, and they still <laughs> had huge, huge effects, uh, benefits for the brain in terms of slowing cognitive decline uh, and slowing brain atrophy but what they found and you know sort of secondary analyses of these studies have, have found is that in order for the b vitamins to work you need adequate uh, omega-3 status because they interact with each other and so that kind of brings us back to this idea that that's that's why the, the sort of you can't just have more of one or the other you need to have enough uh, of both but that's that's kind of the main reason why why b why b12 is is, is so critical and B12 is something, um, I mean, they have found even in mothers who weren't eating meat, but were supplementing with B12 and breastfeeding their babies, there, there is still the potential for permanent brain damage Hmm. in, in these babies that weren't getting the right amount of B12. Yeah. So I, I get really, I get really passionate when I hear about this kind of stuff because it really upsets me. Yeah. And yeah, both the there's so much um there's so much uh, capacity to do harm first by you know preventing the mothers from eating this because you know brain development really starts while that baby is is in is in the in the uterus mm-hmm. you know and there are you know months of time when this brain is growing and the, and those nutrients are needed but then they continue to be required in the breast milk or 
formula, if you formula feed, and then as you start to to transition to solid foods, like these are critical throughout this entire time period. So just bulk removing these foods from the diet, I think, yeah, like you say, has is is really quite worrying. Yeah. And I think a lot of my passion for this comes from being an undiagnosed celiac until I was in my mid twenties and really struggling in school. Um, I actually made it all the way through high school without reading a book, like cover to cover, which is something I, I shouldn't be bragging about, but I, I was able to fake it with, um, being a really great artist and, you know, just making an amazing um, painting about mm-hmm. what I thought the book was about. And I just kind of like blew <laughs> the teachers away and they were like, okay, she's just the art one. Um, but, uh, but I've talked about this with Rob too, because uh, he also said that when he was in high school, like, words would swirl around pages. And, and I'm certain that is because both of us are, um, you know, have autoimmune conditions driven by a gluten intolerance. Um, there was definitely some malnutrition going on. Yeah, we weren't getting it. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Because uh, once I got to grad school and I knew I was celiac, I got straight A's the whole time. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I just, I know the power also of, you know, I, I have two high school t- kids now who um, are very, very athletic, um, very sharp and articulate. And that's not the norm that I'm seeing out there. Um, and the normalization of this hyper palatable ultra processed foods, um, which are, you know, making them overeat co- combined with snacking culture, just families yeah. not sitting down to that meal with like a meat and two vegetables, which, you know, was sort of maybe not that typical when I was growing up in the eighties, but definitely it was more common but you're just not seeing that anymore with uh, how busy and overscheduled people are and, and working parents. And so kids are just grabbing what they enjoy eating and not necessarily what is the best choice. And also the grazing culture where you're just kind of taking that edge off the hunger, um, but not actually being hungry enough to sit down to a healthy meal. Like when I counsel people who have very picky children, I tell them to stop giving them goldfish crackers or whatever, those little snacky things all day long, because that actually allows them to push away the healthy choices um, because they're never actually hungry enough to um, maybe eat something that isn't going to like just light up all their reward sensors in their brain. (laughs) And actually has some nutrients in it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. The, I think this is this is critically important. Uh, you know, the obviously the specific nutrients that we talked about, but then you know the the wider dietary patterns and quality of foods and the effect of ultra processed foods um, for for a few reasons. Um, we, we've just been um, analyzing again this data set from these are babies born extremely preterm, and then we have their growth trajectories after they leave the hospital, and then we look at their neurodevelopmental outcomes. Still only at two years, so still still pretty young um but this seems to kind of continue uh where you see that if they have accelerated weight gain without like parallel increases in height so this is essentially they're just getting fatter and it happens early in life and it's it's something that's partly historically been iatrogenic right it's the doctors have caused this because they're like these babies are small we need to feed them up um and that's kind of been weight gain at any cost. And this seems to cause, well, first of all, there's this issue with sort of early reprogramming. There's these, seems to be these epigenetic and maybe related to the gut microbiome effects. They're still sort of looking at it, but the, you sort of have this stressed early life, both in the uterus and then you're born too early. And these, these kids, these kids, and then the adults are at higher risk of type two diabetes, higher risk of obesity, higher risk of all cause mortality. They die younger. A whole bunch of things um, happen, and, and part of it is the environment that they're born into, and part of it is maybe some some early reprogramming of the immune system and other things. Um, but you see that this sort of greater fat gain, even early on, is associated with worse neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, and conversely, particularly in um, the kids who are born preterm, if they gain relatively more muscle mass, which obviously means that they have to be physically active and they have to eat more protein, um, which means usually means that they're eating higher quality foods overall, 
um, they then have improved cognitive uh, cognitive function. So, you know, you have these nutrient poor uh, ultra processed foods. They're usually very low in protein, which is probably part of the reason why they drive overeating. Mm -hmm. And so then you have these associated um, effects on body composition, and you know, multiple aspects of this: poor nutrients, poor protein, probably you know, a whole bunch of metabolic effects that are coming, you know, long term as body composition sort of changes potentially for the worse. This is then associated with with uh, worse brain function. So, so multiple reasons why, you know, and again, this is not to like scare people away from eating these foods, they just shouldn't make the bedrock of what kids are being fed. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's certainly a time and place for them. But uh, that like, I wrote a post for Rob's blog a long time ago that triggered all the people because I was at a double header middle school softball game and outcome the brownies at halftime at mm -hmm. like, or whatever, not halftime. That, so that's a football term. This is how much I know about sports. It was like <laughs> in, in between the two games yeah. and all the girls had baked brownies and cupcakes for each other. Mm -hmm. And so they brought them to the game and there was like this big sharing thing. And I was like, whose birthday is this? This is, this is a, it's fine that like birthday food, but like, this is just a regular Saturday and it's a sports yeah. event and they hadn't had lunch and nobody else was horrified by it, but me. And I was, I was just sitting there kind of stewing in my chair, you know, watching all of this. Um, so let's talk a little bit before we go about um, uh, sarcopenia and and also um, dementia and Alzheimer's uh, as quickly as you can in the next few minutes. But I mean, there's a lot of people that still don't really understand that um, uh, metabolic issues are really driving um, brain decline later in life. So will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, again sort of multiple angles that, that you can come at this, but I'll, I'll focus on on two in particular. So um, muscle mass or um, loss of muscle mass, sarcopenia, or loss of loss of muscle function, sometimes called dynapenia, um, seems to go sort of hand in hand with aging and cognitive decline. And there's a few reasons why this may be causative to a certain extent. So muscle mass is critical for brain function, for a number of reasons. One is the act of moving your muscles is um, neurotrophic. It, you release a whole bunch of things called myokines, including things like uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, but a whole bunch of stuff that we're still discovering that can actually support growth and, and function of the brain. So physical activity sort of directly releases things that, that um, support brain function. There's also an aspect of this like neuromuscular connection. So by moving your body, you are driving a stimulus to the brain and those connections uh, support brain function. And um, a colleague of mine and I, uh, Josh Turknet, he's a neurologist. We recently wrote a paper about cognitive demand and, and cognitive decline. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's really sort of comes out of multiple threads of evidence says that one of the reasons why we lose brain function is because we just stop using our brains. Um, and by, you know, when we think we're using our brains, you know, we're busy all day, right? I was using my brain all day, but you were just sat in meetings, answering emails, stressed, multitasking. None of that is really challenging your brain. You know, it's, it, it's, it's not the same thing as how you challenge your brain when your brain is growing in the first place. And that's kind of how I think about it. So when kids are developing their brains, they're learning motor skills, social skills, language skills, these things that are really difficult. And they're constantly like pushing to the edge of their abilities, failing, and then getting a bit better and sleeping, right? They get give themselves plenty of rest and recovery to kind of develop and adapt. And that's the kind of thing that we stop doing with our brains. And, and, and physical activity is one of the important ones, um, particularly um, uh, physical activity that has a, a coordination component that seems to be really good for the brain. So if you do a randomized control trial of dancing versus circuit training, dancing is is, is better for the brain. Um, and you can see this on an MRI scan. Uh, and that's probably because there's a coordination component, there's a social component, maybe there's a music component, all these different inputs for the brain are really important. Um, so that's, that's, that's one part of it. And we... Uh, another paper that we currently have under review, we looked at um, 
a big population data set and we had uh, muscle mass, muscle strength, and cognitive function. This is in older adults, uh, people 65 or above. And what we found was that all kinds of physical activity, you know, directly correlated with cognitive function. So that could just be your day to day physical activity, but also any specific attempts to do kind of exercise, um, either resistance training or some kind of aerobic or intense exercise, like all of those things are good, could it just be like walking to, you know, everything else. And then um, strength, muscle strength was one of the best predictors of, of cognitive function. And that could be sort of that neuromuscular function thing um or it could be you know there's some aspects of overall health that are important for for muscle function it could be diet quality that's important too um but what was really shocking to me is that in this data set which is a nationally representative data, data set the nhanes data set muscle mass and physical activity were not correlated um which just doesn't make any sense um except for if you think about how we gain muscle mass and most people in the population gain muscle mass just because they gain more mass in general mm. and in just through overeating through being in a caloric surplus in that setting that muscle is less beneficial because you can see that muscle is not associated with improvements in strength you just gained more muscle but it's not functional so when you're thinking about the connection between muscle mass uh, or muscle and and brain health it has to be the kind of muscle that you developed by actually stimulating your body through some kind of physical activity so that was one of the takeaways that we got that yes muscle is, is important for the brain but only if that's muscle that you've generated through some kind of physical activity which is sadly not that common in the general population mm -hmm. yeah and then um of course as people age their ability to digest protein mm. decreases yeah their uh, requirement for protein increases because of that hmm. um and you know we see of course uh more obesity and overweight people who are over 65 which um you know further leads to their risk of uh brain decline yeah and and those so so th there are a few studies that have looked at say body composition overall and either brain volume like how much how much of your skull is filled with brain or cognitive function and of all the different body composition metrics yes sort of obesity as, as a broad category is associated with worse uh, cognitive function but in reality muscle mass again is the best predictor so uh, more so than fat mass um and I, I think that kind of links for all the reasons that we mentioned um mm -hmm. but you're right as you get older you get this thing called anabolic resistance um, it means that you probably need a different stimulus or at least more protein to get the same, to either get the same muscle gain or retain the same muscle, ma same muscle mass. But this is also the time in life when people tend to eat less and less protein, like particularly if they go into some kind of care facility where, you know, you hardly get any protein at all. And that just accelerates, uh, that accelerates that loss. Um, so, so one of the things that I think is important that kind of comes out of all that is, is eating enough protein which hopefully we've made a good case for and you make a good case for, you know, every time uh, you, you write something mm -hmm. or say something. And I think that's, that's critically important. Um, but there's, there's also this importance of, you know, if we're focusing on uh, body composition and long-term health, cognitive function, cardiovascular disease, all these kinds of things, focusing on gaining muscle, I think is, is something that I would put the focus on rather than say losing weight or losing fat. Because usually when we do that, what we end up doing is just losing a bunch of muscle mass. Um, and it has this sort of self-fulfilling cycle. So anybody can gain muscle. Um, and I think sort of focusing on that gives us this really sort of tangible point that, that will help all those sort of downstream uh, health yeah. effects. Yeah, you see a lot of especially women only doing walking or running and not incorporating any lifting. Um, and it's it's really too bad because as they lose you know, the goal isn't weight loss, as you said, it's fat loss Yeah. Um, by maintaining muscle. And you can really do that best with eating high protein and uh, lifting heavy things. Yes, absolutely. My f Two of my favorite things to do. <laughs> awesome. Um, anything else? Any exciting projects you have coming up? Where can people find you? Um, yeah, uh, people can find me mainly on Instagram uh, at Dr. Tommy Wood. That's where 
you know, I'm getting a little better at if there's a podcast and there's a reel or something associated with it, I'll, I'll post it there and I'll post podcasts and stuff in my stories. If I, if I publish a paper that's relevant to this, I'll, I'll post it there or to, to all this kind of health stuff. Um, I'm tentatively working on a book, but we'll see how I'm in talk with some publishers. So we'll see how that comes together. And that will be a, a sort of a very practical and approachable um, sort of book about brain health and, and cognitive function. So that that maybe in the next few months, there'll be more news on that. Okay, well, uh, just let me know. And I'm happy to promote anything Great. you put out there because I'm a huge fan. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the invite. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.